which feels like, um, you know, Impressionism 101, um, when I get the questions like we've got today. Um, and of course it is, uh, but uh, Impressionism in the sense of how do you approach drawing uh, when you're given a visual ensemble, you know, when you're given a, a, a thing like what you're seeing here with me, when you see, get this little unit in a rectangle, what's the best, what's the most logical way to proceed to get the relationships right in that, in that, um, uh, in that frame, in that frame of reference, you know? So you've all heard, what are my darkest darks? What are my lightest lights? Uh, is, you know, it's a question that, uh, that you can't escape, obviously, and it's. But the first thing that comes should come to your mind is what we're. What are we doing when we say what's the darkest dark and the lightest light? Well, we're establishing the order of the values. So if you understand the order of the values uh, idea, then you understand the whole idea of order. And now uh, what we're talking today, the questions I have have to do with the order spatial, right? Now, values isn't. I mean, you could argue it's spatial in a certain sense, but it really isn't. They depend on each other. Uh, to create a sense of space, and they depend on other things as well, which we talked about. But uh, really, the, even as I said before, even the ability to draw a bone in your anatomy lesson requires your capacity to see things as values. And so to order the universe of the bone that's sitting in front of you that you're actually trying to draw to learn from requires a preliminary education, which we, I call it impressionism. Like Gamble called, used to refer to it as, as lower eye impressionism. And I think that's a very worthy uh, uh, phrase. I mean, very worthwhile, very, very uh, uh, helpful. All right. So after watching your DVD special uh, draw, uh, pencil drawing in the visual order and having done some work in the site size method, as well as work from construction drawing, how would you recommend a beginning student develop their eye with the visual order in mind? There's so much to this, but he makes, he goes on to make a single point that I think is what he's really after, what we really probably should be talking about here. And, uh, but let's just talk about a couple things. Um, everything in painting is, is um, to be right is to be relationally right, right? So the size relationships and all that sort of thing. So how is site size, that is say the site size method people use, useful? And then uh, how would be how would construction drawing be useful? So to, to simplify, I would suggest simply to you take the idea of construction drawing first and say, isn't nature comprised, you know, when you look at shape making, isn't it comprised of angles? You know, major points running into other major points making angles. Yeah, it is. It doesn't mean that construction drawing is the smartest way to get to, 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 to um, from A to Z, you know, to get to where you're going. And, and I, my experience tells me it isn't, but, uh, uh, the, um, but, and the side size method then has, has its own sort of built in usefulness, but not before you actually make an attempt to draw what you see relationally, right? So then what would be the use of side size? Well, this, so then his point is, and I'm going to use this point because in that conversation, there's this thing. So, so that is, considering things like proportion, line, and value are yet to be under the control of the student, should a student be using a needle and plumb line? Now, needle is the way people, I, as I understand it, use them are, you know, ways of measuring lengths, you know. Uh, we used, you know, just holding up the, 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 root, the, the, the end of the brush in your hand and going like this and checking how many of those there are. And that's a very... It's a very erratic one. I mean, you're much better off using a ruler and reading, for example, to see how many heads there are. Read, put one inch on the head and see how many and a half it comes to when you get to the foot. That's a proportional reading. And those things, all those things are actually useful after you've made a visual attempt, okay? Because you'll never strengthen your, your muscles <laughs> if you keep on using your crutches. And those are fallback positions, but some of them are very useful ways of checking. One of the, what was the other thing in a plumb line? Now, now, Degas, I mean, Sargent said, never let the plumb line out of your left hand. I believe he said your left hand, whatever, out of your hand, out of your other, your non-painting hand. Well, why? Well, because angles are that important. That's all. But if you plumb your painting, when you're painting, and you set up your, your you set up your, your, um, your um, canvas, and you plumb one edge of it, you have plumb in your eye right there. And if you put that definitely plumbed edge between 
between between yourself and the sitter, right? So you're you're standing there looking, and there's there's the painting, there's the sitter, and there's this line right down the middle that is plum. Then you have a permanent reference. So the idea of plum is always in your brain, you know. It's but almost almost so always as if you were building a brick building and you had to plumb all the you know or any kind of building. If you're not getting the walls vertical, you're having your building's going to fall down, obviously. So. Um, should a student be using a needle in a plumb line? Well, never, you know, I don't care what you use <laughs> to check yourself, uh, providing it's actually, you know, an accurate reading device. But uh, the first thing to do, for example, you want to get an angle, your job is to get the angle right to vertical. It has no other meaning. And your second job, of course, would be to get it right to other angles. So there's all sorts of use of that. But but if, you, if, you don't, if you're using an inadequate method of transferring, if you think by holding up this angle to nature and then you transfer over to here, uh, all well and good, except that it doesn't matter. It, it could be possibly a way to check something if it's actually accurate, but isn't, it isn't the accuracy that you actually have to have. You have to have the, the sense of this angle to that. So that's where you're operating again, as Ang would say, from a concept. If you don't have a concept of the angle relationships, of the angle to vertical, fixed in your mind, and now you're not going anywhere, that's what you're trying to train. So if you do any measuring first, you're not training anything that's useful. You're not becoming a relational painter, right? So that's the most fundamental thing about an impressionist, the guy painting from his eyes and the naive eye, among other things, at that. Uh, <clears throat> so... Uh, is there any reason a student needs to learn to do an outline in reference to Gamel? Uh, essentially, how does one learn to see? Well, yeah, I mean, anything you see. If we, we set up casts in the studio so that the most dominating line is the outline so that you can actually study shape and do proportions on a com, you know, of a complex, uh, you know, sort of a bump count, like bump abstraction, right? <laughs> you know, a chunk, 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 you know, and get all the big proportions, all little, all little bumps and all those things, right? Yeah, it's a very, very important exercise. Uh, you have to be able to see those things, whether you actually have to articulate them in an impressionist painting in the start. You still have to be able to see them. They don't go anywhere. So even when you're dealing with just three or four points making up this abstraction we call the arabesque, you have to still be able to see... Uh, you have still be able, have to be able to see that thing um, uh, in terms of its own shape, right? Even if it's a simplified shape, it's still, say it's five-sided and it's and you're thinking of it as it's just points, so they wind up being five-sided. It still has a gesture, it still has proportions in that those set of points do. And you have to be good at that. Okay, it doesn't seem like I'm getting to this point here to me and I want to get, I want to go ahead and go through this and then go to the next question. This is from Jason. Uh, the next question is from Gail, but they're related to each other, so I'm trying to do them both at once. So should a student be using a needle uh, and plumb line? Is there any reason a student needs to learn to do the outline? Uh, shapes, values, etc. Essentially, how does one learn to see? Right, right, exactly, right. I've already largely indicated that. So this is a huge question. How do you learn to see, right? But if seeing is seeing relationally, then you have to practice. I think of myself as a kid trying to, to figure out how to dribble a basketball. You know, somebody could explain it to me all day long, but how do you learn to dribble a basketball? But grab a hold of it and just run up and down the floor and try not to lose it while you're bouncing. you got to run up and down the floor and, and, and what we call dribbling the basketball if you haven't played the game. Uh, you have to be able to bounce it on the floor while you're running. You can never hold it and run. So that whole thing is this peculiar little art. How do you get it? You, you just mess around until you get it. Some people tell you try this, some people tell you try that, some people tell you watch the ball, some people tell you never watch the ball. But between all of them, you'll learn how to do it, right? But if you don't practice drawing relationally, you'll never draw relationally, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, um, so when considering that all things in drawing and painting being relational, the visual order makes the most sense, but it's rather a daunting task when training the eye from the start to consider the possibilities, okay? Now, what I like about now, what I like about uh, Gail's question, she says, thanks, I totally get the magnitude of this video. I actually don't remember which one it is, so I apologize, but I know that it's one that shows the point-angle conversation. I'm be I'll begin working this way soon. I can definitely see the value. It looks to me like getting the correct placement of the leading elements correctly is the biggest challenge. Now, that's an interesting point, by the way. She used the word correct twice. And I, at first, was thinking, oh, that's redundancy. But in reality, of course, you have to get the correct placement of the correct elements. And <laughs> so, so to use it twice well is a good idea, right? So what are the correct ones? Well, 
yeah, I like gamble. It's not a question of right and wrong. It's also not a question of correct and incorrect. But, but it is a question of, of the most useful, the most beneficial. And so there are more important points and there are less important ones. So those would be the, what I'd call, you, you might want to call the correct points. And then there's the, um, the correctness of those points, right? So now I can't remember who it was. And I'd like to tell you it was Alfred Stevens, but I can't remember who it was. And, but one of the, one, a good painter of, from the past said, you have to be able to draw the things, you know, things related to things right through everything that's already there. Now, what I mean to say is, for example, you have to be able to see the color and not the object. And what you have to do is be able to see the salient points, you know, and by blurring your eyes, if you blur your eyes just looking at me on the screen, if you blur a ton, you'll be able to see three or four major points. You have to be able to see those, draw those, right? But if you can't even see them, now, some people think, well, if I, if I get all this and all this and all this, then it all looks like that, then I'll have those points. But the ability to see points or to see uh, elements separated, right, and so uh, is, is a key thing. I think of it as like in, in the computer windows, if you go to the part of the thing that says bullets, you'll get the bullets. And if you go to the part that says um, uh, alignment, you'll get alignment. If you go to the part that says, you know, uh, uh, spacing between lines, you'll get that, right? Well, in much the same way, you have to be able to say, at the beginning of a painting, for example, we're talking about the leading points. You have to be able to go to the window of the points, okay? And so that's what the blurred eye is for, is to tell you which points, right? The primary points, the dominant. Now, so that's what I'm telling you are the correct points. <laughs> if you're an impressionist, if you can't do major easy things, this is what I discovered personally, if you can't do major easy things, you just can't do. And, uh, and if you can't align them, then you've got to learn to align them. Is there a best practice? Yeah, just keep doing it until you can. But... But, but again, when I was a kid playing basketball, I said to myself, I got to figure this out. And I found places to play the, to, to bounce the basketball, run, to run and bounce the basketball, run and bounce. I just had to made up my, I made up my own practice. Nobody actually, I suppose if you're, if you're working with a coach, the coach will say, do this and do that. Maybe. But I know that most of this stuff is self-taught. You actually have to say, oh, I see your point. Now, how do I, I got to start practicing that. And every part of painting as you develop is just like that. You have to say, I get this. I must have this thing. It's clearly part uh, and, and probably a key part of uh, or an essential part of, of, of the whole practice. Have I built it in yet? Well, how would I do that? Is then, be, then becomes your job. That is your permanent job, right? To The best practices. Why you study with somebody is because, because it's well-directed practice, right? So I'm telling you what to practice, but nobody can do it. You simply try and do things, try and do things, and make sure you have in mind that thing, that one thing that you're trying to do. I found I could do it right in the middle of doing a painting. I could say, you know, look, I'm not even doing angles and proportion. I mean, angle relationships, right to vertical every time. And I'm, so I, I got to build that in to my system. And all I could do was say, all right, the back straggler is this color over here. So I'm going to look at this color, and I'm going to look at its angle relationships to vertical. That angle. So as soon as I see that color to another color. Oh, there are two different places on the page. I'll notice the angle to vertical, even when I'm just doing color. Now, obviously, when you're dealing with angles or points for the purpose of, 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 of aligning things you think of as shapes, that sort of thing, you would do that. But I found that if I wanted to do it, I <coughs> had to do it to everything, just so I wouldn't lose track of the fact that that was a primary self-practice mission, right? Best practice mission, et cetera. So the question, how long does it take your students to develop accuracy at that? I found that accuracy at any of these things takes about 15 minutes, maybe a half hour. <laughs> that, I know I've said it before. It sounds completely nuts. It's not. It's not. I, see, once I left Gamble, I was on my own. And you know, when you, that whole feeling of being on your own is a big deal, right? I mean, in other words, you know, the whole world is, your whole platform is just dropped out from under you. So I, the first thing I did was I said, well, what, what do I need to know? And then I realized, yeah, but do you practice it? So then I thought, best practices, what do I need to, you know, what do I need to, what I know, do I practice it? And then how would I make those things best practices? I realized that I had to make myself an automaton, so I'd automatically do the right things. So um, if you can see what I'm saying, though, that, that I, I just said, okay, then I would, I'll watch I, and at that point, I stopped watching just the painting. I do the backstraggler of the painting. The backstraggler is just that thing that's least like when you look at the grand ensemble. It's an impressionist idea uh, in the grandest sense of the word impressionist that applies to everybody who ever, <laughs> which is why everybody's an impressionist in a sense. Um, but I'd say, what's the backstraggler of the area? Uh, whatever. And then I would say, 
But if I knew I was working personally, see, I had my own back straggler. It was angles to vertical. It was whatever came up that I could see I wasn't doing in practice. You don't have to have the right one. Just grab one. So I, my best practice was to say, my, my, my activity then was from that moment, I said, okay, best practice is for me, and I'm trying to fix this part of the painting. So I made sure, among all anything else I may have been doing with that part of the painting, even if it was fixing a chroma, you have to get the chroma right to something else in the picture, right? Otherwise, it's what you're doing, right? That's relational, relational, relational. But practice that first, of course. Just do everything relationally. But then, uh, and you'll have that practice. But in a particular way, you know, so as soon as I said, well, the chroma's wrong, well, I said, to what? Then I looked down over there and I would say, now, what are those two things doing in relation to vertical? And I would have that practice going on. And I'd find that I would forget in the course of about, I was trying to do it for a half hour. I had no clue how long it would take. And by the time I would find I'd forget doing it for 15 minutes, but the next day I'd be doing it automatically. So there's something about that that's kind of interesting. And I think it's just paying attention. It's almost like when somebody asks you to memorize a lot, you know, a name. Say you say somebody comes in the room and you just, you know, I played around in politics. It was very, it's a very difficult thing to do if you don't have, if you don't have the capacity to remember names. And, uh, you know, how can I be putting names in my, you know, I need to memorize more important things, right? Well, so you have to, act, you find you don't pay attention. That's all it is. So if you'll just simply, when somebody says their name, if you actually will just pause long enough to pay attention, you'll get, you'll have their name. You'll probably have it more or less permanently. And you'll have it attached to their face. In our case, you, you'll have that. If you practice that for that 15 minutes, that's all it is, is just bringing awareness constantly for a little bit of time to that one practice. So now that's a long verbal way of talking about this. Let me look at pictures with you, okay? Uh, if a student has never worked that way before, should they start with a lot of quick pencil or, oopsie, didn't mean to do that. Should they start with a lot of quick pencil um, or charcoal sketches like gesture drawings? How do you recommend starting to work this way? Now, because you want to start working it the way I'm talking about every time you go out to paint, the easy thing to do is to, this is your time to learn to practice blurring your eyes. So blur your eyes to see which three or four or five things you are going to articulate, right? Now, don't think you leave your eyes blurred to make, you're not just gonna make smudges, although theoretically you could just make smudges and just try to get locations right in space. But you're gonna do more than that. So um, you're gonna articulate. So I'm gonna show you what I did and just we'll just walk through it. <clears throat> but the, um, uh, but, the, but the start of every painting really is that. You have to reduce down to what are the things I'm going to actually be using to set this painting up, okay? <clears throat> All right. So now we can jump over. Now, this is the one I've showed you before. This is my own work where I actually finally slowed my entire mentality down and said, what actually should I draw first? What should I draw second and what should I draw third? Because I was getting so sick and tired of having 30 and 40 things wrong in a picture. And, and so, you know, one of the things you fundamentally will, will pick up on is that every, um, uh, oh, what was I going to say? <laughs> I lost track. My, 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 my table seemed to be moving, so I'm sorry. Oh, so every, every, every painting to actually not be chasing, having you chasing your tail. Every drawing, every painting needs to be set up from a parameters point of view. Parameters, you know, like in we're so we're saying, well, how big do you want the figure in the painting, for example, if you're doing a figure painting? So in the case of Gamel, he would have actually have us, so if you look at this picture here, he would have us actually isolate that uh, with a mark. And you guys doing sight size will do that if anybody's trained in the lack way. You make a mark for the top and you go down somewhere here and you make a mark for the bottom, right? Now, we would typically find something like on a foot here or something like that. And, uh, and then we would have, have a happy day drawing the outline of the figure. Now, uh, we're not so happy and find ourselves full of all these problems because we had no idea what we were doing. So the first thing I discovered was that a mark up here and a mark down there. Well, oh, yes. And so I was trying to find out how many errors I had right away. And again, I've repeated this before. So you'll, you, you, you should hear it again, though. Because, uh, but what I found was that I can have a top and I can have a bottom, but they're only locations this way, right? And the vertical. And, um, but I, but a top and bottom are already located this way as well, just by my putting them there, right? 
So uh, what I need to do is have something that tells me where I'm placing this thing left and right and, and where I'm putting it and, and, and what are the relationships of those of this point up this top to whatever we choose to be the bottom. What are the relationships by angle to each other, right? First thing I realized suddenly, you know, when I did this was I need to actually make these points really, really well. I had to actually draw this and mass it slightly so I could actually see what I was talking about. Then I had to draw enough of whatever what I was working on down here and mass it well. So uh, I, I think I may have chosen the line right there the bottom for the bottom of this rather than the foot. And, uh, and as soon as I did it, I saw I couldn't locate with that. So I actually went over to this because I thought, well, I can locate with that because that's actually turning a corner. So I can locate this way. I can locate with this here. I pick that as my low spot. But between this thing here and this thing here, I can locate uh, them by angle if I get a top point here. And this top point is pretty, is barely adequate, right? So at some point, I find myself needing to mark this and even mark this. But then I have this bigger problem now, which I have to solve, and you have to solve them right now. You can't just keep going fast, which is if I do this and this, or if I do this and this, in other words, there's a width involved. And if there's a width involved, then the width has to be right to what? Well, to the height, right? Because the height's fixed and permanent. The height is, a, is, is, is the leading measurement in an, an entire painting. It's the fixed measurement. If you don't know what fixed, if you don't know that you must, uh, the value of fixedness, let's put it that way. If you don't know the value of it, you won't know why you then have to get the widths right uh, to it, right? But everything is relational. So the be very beginning of this thing is I have to get this width, right? I've chosen this. This is the low point. But then I had to do this and this. And then I had, as I said, angles to, to the stuff up here, most particularly to this point. And as soon as I get around here, angles to better points, actually, because they're more readable and they're stronger. Now, wait, let me pause for a second. More readable and they're um, horizontal, vertical, so they're more useful. Uh, I did say right at the beginning, you're going to blow your eyes and see where the strong players. And now I'm not even talking about strong players, am I? So you see that you're always in this quandary, so to speak, or you're in this interplay or this conflict between the pragmatic, which is the top and bottom, left and right, and the visual effect. So I found right then that my, that my, I was doing these things, but the visually, the strength of this had to be greater. This dark had to be darker than this dark, or even this dark. These darks here were darker. And the contrasts were different, so I had to get the contrast right. So now I'm in the visual order while I'm also in this, what I call the spatial order, right? So there's the top. There's the bottom. There is really the bottom, which is this plus this and that. And then I have to get the width right to the top, and that's the beginning of the practice of relational, right? Now, most people think of relational as just subdividing, subdividing, subdividing. How tall is the head to this? That's, that's where that question of the, you know, of the needle comes in, right? But it's not, it's not, in fact, your most important question at the beginning. It's the top and bottom and establishing widths. But, and, and above all, all, it's establishing the location on the page. So your job is actually uh, to create the sense of equilibrium, right? It's always your job. It's practice you've got to get good at in painting. But equilibrium only means that the, if you divided a painting right down the middle, that the left mass would balance the right mass, right? <laughs> Did I say that in reverse? But, so the, um, but if you understand that, you can actually drop a plumb through, through nature. And, but you have to really sort of let yourself go and, and move the line back and forth, back and forth, hunting for equilibrium. That famous story, equilibrium, is, it matches the word repose, which is you, can't, you must have repose in a picture. You can't have a picture looking like it's going to fall over and like it's empty on one side. Um, it's just, it, it creates the, the, this vacuum creates a problem in, human, in, the, in the human viewer, right? So from, the, from earliest times, people have, have, have accepted the idea that we need that, uh, that we need absolute repose, and yet you can still create a sense of, in a, of disequilibrium, but you have to still do it in repose. It's a very interesting problem. That it's very but too complicated for anybody who's trying to figure out how to draw. <laughs> so, but anyway, so you might find, for example, that, that say, say that, it doesn't look like, maybe this, goes right, by some chance, goes right smack through, uh, through the middle. Or maybe it isn't that, maybe, whatever. I, I'm having, it's hard to see it right here. Maybe it's that mark right there. 
but something will go right smack through the middle and you'll, you'll actually can jump everything else, jump everything you've been doing and walk over and put that down. If you do, you have to get in the right place vertically and you have to get in the right place this way and you have to make it do it with the right effect, right? Look of nature at that point, right? So you're not drawing this thing as an object. You're not even drawing it as a shadow. You're drawing, you're drawing what you need of it as a value unit, but most particularly with a value, meeting a value with a particular edge that has the look of nature and is comparatively right, right? So if this is a sharp edge and this is a turning edge, your job is to suggest form. At the beginning of these kinds of paintings, we suggest, see, people call it um, uh, sketching, you know, articulating that turn there when you first put it down. Uh, but it's not sketching, actually. It's, um, it's, it's, summary. It's, a, it's a summary statement of the look of nature at edge which has a form element to it to even be to even to even be right has to have the right sort of sense of form so i know i'm making this incredibly complicated right huh so <laughs> but anyway so but let's just talk about points and angles then uh, because that's all this conversation comes to so if you're doing that with this guy you can understand that you would get a top and bottom and eventually you need to get the most dramatic strong reading things out there as part of the conversation so you can actually see the big the big width, talking to the greater width, right? But then there's always this combination of things that are establishing your values, which is the visual order of things. So your dark is dark and all those things. Uh, this thing out here is the farthest left area, so it actually has some requirements that way. You know, the greatest width, we're trying to talk about the greatest dimensions of the thing and how they're relating to this. Um, so now if you put down a handful of points, maybe say you're getting this, this, and maybe even right down to here, you're getting this thing here, this thing here, maybe even some of this, you're going to be able to see very quickly, maybe you'll have a little bit out here, a little bit out there, you're going to see very quickly that you have the gesture and proportions, even before you close the line. And that's where we talk about floating lines, but the word floating is a good word, and it, we're talking in this case about rather floating points. Uh, but, but in the case of, of, of Paxton, from whom we hear that word, floating line, this line here actually floats, right? Now, it physically floats because in plenty, many places it's just lost. So how can you say it's a continuous line, right? It isn't visually a useful line as a continuum. Well, this is going to be so complicated. I, I think I'm talking uh, over everybody's head. That worries me. Let's just go to a painting. Uh, points and angles, the same old thing here. You know, when you're dealing with uh, the points, uh, you blur the heck out of your eyes. You can see plainly that this stuff over here is really strong and therefore, for that reason, important. This is really strong. Uh, and so what you're going to do is say, well, i got to draw these strong guys. So you draw it and then you say, oh, it's in the wrong place. And when you say that, now you're exactly in my world, right? The whole canvas is white two seconds ago. And by the way, this isn't a white of the canvas. This should be the white that isn't the canvas. It should be darker than the canvas. Because otherwise you won't, that's that whole class of things called saving your whites. You know, you need, you'll need them for accent. That's sort of conversation. It's a very real one. But also if you have, if you're trying to get color on a white canvas, it'll, it'll be less, the, any color you use is darker than white, right? So, and you do need to get color, especially when white, right? What did, what did, what did um, Alfred Stubbins again say? He said, you can tell a great colorist because of the way they paint whites or a colorist, a good colorist, whatever. But so, uh, you'll set down this white in our way of working. On a white canvas, this will look like a dirty smudge, except it'll have color. This will look like a dirty smudge. And you'll spot around. We, we, we do this thing. We spot around some colors. We're looking for the color scheme. So we're looking for the most chromatic, say red. That's why that's there. We're, this is a major color. Spot, spot, spot. The floor. This gray here. You see what I'm doing. It's all we spot these colors around as impressionists, right? But immediately you have this problem. As soon as those colors look like they're plausibly going in the direction... If you're thinking like a Boston School painter, you're immediately thinking about this rectangle right here. And this is where the reason I bring this viewfinder into play is because when you're doing it our way, uh, you have a, um, you have a, a frame uh, that you could be using and you would be using and you would, um, you'd simply be finding the exact uh, proportion of your painting. Uh, and then you'd be looking through that to to uh, organize this, the elements of the painting. And the organization of the elements to a frame is, is multiple. It's, um, it's, it's got everything to do with um, how big this stuff is in the rectangle, but all that stuff has to do with 
tops and bottoms, left and right. So what we have to do is locate, say, this and this and this. They all have to be in the right place in relation to the frame's edge that, as you look through a viewfinder. This thing here has to be in the right place in relation to top and bottom. So that's a locating the middle portion. But all the exits are very important. This location is very important. This one is. These are the things that establish your painting. So these become points in a spatial sense, like we said top and bottom on the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the previous one. Uh, now we're saying, oh, look, what are we doing here? Well, now we're trying to organize a frame, something within a frame. Now, people want to just say, I'm just going to paint what I see. Well, you can't, actually. You have to, you have to choose where it's going to be located in the frame. Uh, to do our kind of work and to do it, and, and the pleasure, the joy, the fun of it is actually to do it directly from life uh, to a particular size. I'm afraid this is getting long and it's going to have to get long. Uh, it's going to get longer. This will be the third one in a row with my apologies, to, especially to my producer. He told me I needed to do one of the short ones. And I, and I could make this a short one possibly by a little bit by saying, yeah, just do your points, you know, just have some practices. But what you need to be doing, though, is getting good at establishing light effects right here that make this point, or this thing, meaning this, that make that exit, right? And then learn to line that up in the right place from here to there. And then learn to line it up by angle to, say, there. And, but you don't get to escape from these points. It's all about these points. So, except the fun of it is, you can see in this, in this start of a painting, which I did for a demonstration, the start of it is really full of imp the implied, right? Because there's so much truth in it already. So the light that's here, the orange color relationships, all those things, the stairs going up, all that stuff. It was very, very nice uh, to have an intern stand and who was working for the Guild. That was done in the, in the Guild's uh, lower gallery, to have that person uh, being willing to stand because it made a very exciting uh, thing for us. Uh, in any case, so, um, so you see what I'm talking about. So then it winds up being about points, right? So here we make a point by doing this, right? Now, if you sit here thinking I'm drawing this, you'd be lost, right? But if you, if you actually say, I'm trying to locate that thing as a point, and I'm point relating it to all those points that I've already established, right? Then you, that you've already established spatially, then you understand what I'm doing. I'm actually establishing as an effect, getting its contrast and all that sort of right, and just enjoying the process, right? The edge, the value contrast and all that sort of thing. With nothing in mind, but if I got that then, say, okay, now, did I get in the right place? And don't worry yourself over the right place. Worry yourself over the effect, okay? And actually articulating a nice point. And by the time you've moved it a couple times, you're going to be doing it like, like, like you were a genius, like, like you're going to look really smart. You're going to look like, you, in your painting, at the end of the day, you're going to look like you just blew that on in the right place, which is what everybody wants, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, but anyway, these are all points. You see what they're, and, and now what you have to do is be aware of the idea of what's useful to you. What's, what's going to help you spatially and visually? And of course, when you're setting parameters, the darkest dark and the lightest light, say this is the darkest dark or some other parts of the darkest dark and the lightest light, it's very important to establish those. As like everything else, it's very important to establish your leading chromas. It's very important to establish um, uh, then be, uh, and th the effects. But none of this is spatial in the sense, of, except it is, by the way, but not in the sense of up and down, left and right, which is what you really have to be good at. I'll add this one little thing so you know it, and that is that you have to be able to see the thing as if it were already a painting. You have to be able to see the world as two-dimensional, or this doesn't actually make anywhere near as much sense. If you keep going in and out and back and forth, and your eyes keep touching on things, and you'll just get lost. Uh, I say your eyes, you actually touch things with your eyes. Physically. Your eyes go zooming in like to grab onto something. You do that all the time. You have to stop doing that and take in the thing as a two-dimensional whole, and this actually makes sudden logic that you wouldn't have had before. Anyway, so I'm going to say then that, again, that you, you make these color spots, you make the value relationships right to each other, you make chromal relations, the red, yellow, blue relations right to each other, and then you bring them together and you make the effects, and you make the effects right to each other, and all the while you're doing spatial. And each of these things that is doing spatial, now you remember, again, this just place on the, plate, on the page. Where is it in relation to what? So that's the where on the page, uh, and that, again, is all just two-dimensional, and it's just such a relief you can stay there. And, uh, and, but each time you do one of those points, it has to be right in relation to your strongest point, which is why that strongest point is sitting there. And then this process becomes one of just collating after that, which is all it is anyway, right? When you said, what's the darkest dark and the lightest light in the beginning of a painting? You said, oh, it's a collating problem. Everybody who ever told you that may have said that, may have, not, may have recognized that he must do that, 
but he may not have gone the whole distance and said, you know, if it's a collating problem of dark and light, then maybe it's a collating problem of everything visual. And the reality is, of course, it is. And that's why Impressionism is the only uh, process that's visually logical. And I don't say Impressionism meaning Monet, doesn't, although Monet's right and in, in, in does it. But I'm just saying that Impressionism in that sense of let's look at the visual impression and ask what's the most logical way to proceed. You won't find anything, including when you're drawing anatomy structures or doing anything related to, uh, to perspective. If you can't do this, you won't be working very sanely. So this is, precedes all of those things, the ability to just organize the stuff in front of you, which is exactly what Gail and uh, Jason are uh, doing, are talking about. So I'm going to just show you one more picture and get out of here. Um, I've already spent too much time. But you can see, in this case, I brought it close. This is the Joseph de Camp, and I brought it in nice and close. And I want you just to observe, and I'm sorry it's going to break up on your screen a little bit, but if you don't look real hard at this, you'll see what I mean. But look at the brilliant articulateness of, this is the leading effect, right? You see these spots. These are points. These are points of effect, but they're also points by angle. And so if you understand that even the best of our guys do this stuff, you know, here's, here's the, this is a key spot. If you can't articulate that effect and get the shape right and, and get something useful by way of points or angles so you can line it up with something else and do the lining up good, you're not going anywhere, which is, brings us all the way back to that very simple question. Find yourself ways to do this, but every time you go out there, just do it, okay? Don't do anything with rulers. Don't do anything with construction and trashing your paper with lines. Go out there and decide what two points you're going to draw, and then get them right to each other, spatially, on the page. You know, choose top and bottom, get them right by angle to each other, get them right by effect to each other, and you'll be doing this in no time at all. Now, what will happen is you're going to eventually realize that nothing else is useful. You'll give up everything else you've been doing. But when you're a student, and this is the caveat to Jason, when you're a student, there are things you can check. And even if you're not a student, there's nothing, no harm from time to time if you're laying in even a portrait, uh, or maybe even especially a portrait um, from, 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 you know, in a life-size setting and the model sitting way over there to go ahead and check a proportion with a ruler. And I do, I do say, don't do this thing with this, you know, don't do this thing like this. Get a ruler out and read. Put one inch on the head <laughs> and read to see what and a half it comes to down here when you get to the, to the place where you're cutting it off with the frame, say. And check yourself from time to time. Don't have too much hubris. You know, it's very easy to think, well, I'm, I'm good now, you know. Now, I'll end on one thought, and that is the guy who's really good, ultimately, is the guy who works the hardest. Gamble said to me, I said to Gamble once, he said, I said, what, when is all this measuring? I was sight science teaching, right? He said, when, do I, when, do I, when does all this measuring stuff stop? Because I was getting more and more averse to even painting because of all this burden of this tedious mechanics. And he says, the cure for measuring is more measuring. And, and of course, he was right, but he's wrong. Not sight size measuring. The cure for measuring is, 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 and so I said actually to myself, I said, you know, I'm not gonna paint this way. This will make me crazy. I'm gonna, but I'm gonna, when Gamble comes in, I'm gonna be more accurate than the other guys. And I found the only way I could be more accurate than the other guys was to do more comparisons. And then I was never less accurate. I've never been, I've never had a problem since. But you do have this one little burden. You have to look more ways at whatever it is you're drawing than the other guys. You have to compare in more ways. You can compare this to this and that to that and then this to this and that to that and more and more. And you do it until you're, there's no doubt, whatever, that you're right in relation to all these other places that you could find. And that has to do with spatial, color, chroma, everything else. So... Very good, very enjoyable and uh, to see the Jason and, and Gail doing so much, um, you know, seeing clearly what I'm talking about or seeing, beginning to see clearly the value of what I'm talking about. Just party. I mean, just go find best practices for yourself. You know, the confidence you get by becoming self-taught, by teaching yourself to dribble, you know what I mean, uh, is huge and you need it. And you need it for everything. So, uh, yeah, on that happy note, though, uh, please uh, try, 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 try hard, uh, trial and error, and um, uh, enjoy, you know, that's all I can say. Uh, if, you, if you're enjoying this, uh, do subscribe, uh, share, and, uh, and uh, all the rest. Comment, comment for sure, okay? Thumbs down, thumbs down. Sight sizes. <laughs> all right, next time, take care.